So you might recall a video I did a few months ago where I talked about how the son of the popular pastor John Piper, his son is an atheist who gained now over a million followers on TikTok, where he, among other things, he mocks and makes fun of Christianity. Now, recently, he put out a video where he complains about hell and how evil God would have to be if hell were real. And here's what he says. So John McRae of What Do You Mean recently posted a short response to John Piper's son's Abraham's video on hell. So I'll be doing a response to a response. And just so you know, I like John and his channel, so there's no animosity between us. Mainly because we don't know each other, but you get the point. People saying they wish hell was real yesterday. You hear that a lot after notorious people die, and I resonate with that. Nobody actually means it, they're just pissed, and they're expressing their frustration hyperbolically. <laughs> but my brain always goes to the same place and takes it literally. Let's say Christian Hellfire is real. If I got to hold the worst person ever over an open flame, how long could I do it? It's stupid and grotesque, but we're talking about hell here, so yeah, stupid and grotesque. Could I even do it for five seconds? No, of course not, and neither could you, because it doesn't matter how bad they are, we are good. Good enough to not burn people alive anyway. What's interesting to me about this thought experiment that nobody asked me to conduct is that it shows you have to be insanely evil yourself to give evil people what they deserve. Only evil people can give evil people what they deserve. Because maybe, despite all our instincts, punitive justice is bull****. The overwhelming urge to give people what they deserve is one of the stupidest and most destructive aspects of human nature. So his basic point is that if you're a good person, then you wouldn't allow someone to suffer or even be tortured, even if they did deserve it. In fact, he argued how stupid and evil you would have to be in order to give evil people what they deserved. Okay, maybe Abraham still has a little John Piper in him. In reality, atheists who leave Christianity often stay fundamentalist Christians that presuppose God is this retributive deity out for blood, hell bent on killing sinners because in some way we deserve it. That's not the God that I nor a plethora of other Christians believe in. My God is not a retributive tyrant who needs to punish evildoers. Therefore, in my theology at least, the language of what we deserve is replaced with the consequences that result from sin. Sin is its own punishment. So in reality, Abraham is wrong about God believing that we deserve hell. Rather, God acknowledges the fact that our choices and actions have negative consequences on our well-being that effectively drives us away from the good and that leads us to suffering on our behalf and on the behalf of others. A child that disobeys his mother's warning to not touch the hot eye on the stove and burns his hand has experienced the negative consequences of his disobedience. In reality, you don't need God to be a, be a vindictive deity that's out to get us. God more so is out to save us from the negative consequences of our own sins. Just dessert is out the window. There. Abraham's premise of people deserving punishment was refuted. God doesn't require punishment for sins. The consequences of sin are punishment enough. Rather, God desires reconciliation and healing. What is Hitler being burned in hell for eternity, never turning from his sin, descending deeper and deeper into madness, convinced that he is his own God, to a Hitler coming to grips with his evilness and realizing that he has caused so much pain and suffering to millions of people, and in a posture of repentance and contriteness, God facilitates the reconciling of every broken relationship between Hitler and every Jew, eventually resulting in the forgiveness and genuine love between them. That is true justice, and I would say that it's objectively better than Abraham's retributive view of God. Now, what's wrong with this argument? Lots of things, almost too many to count, but let's just go ahead and roll with it and assume that everything that he says here is true. So let's go ahead and say that he's right and that it would be evil to actually give somebody who is evil what they deserve. So now with that in mind, let's go ahead and immerse ourselves a little bit more deeply into this world that Abraham Piper dreams about. I want you to remember how Abraham said that giving people what they deserve is actually one of the biggest issues with human nature. Remember, he said this. The overwhelming urge to give people what they deserve is one of the stupidest and most destructive aspects of human nature. Now what's ironic here is that his video here was intended to criticize Christianity, but in reality, his critique only works for every other religion besides Christianity. Salvation in every other religion is quite literally based on you getting what you deserve. But the central message of Christianity is that God loved his creation so much that he came into our world and died in our place so that way we wouldn't get what we deserved. He didn't get what he deserved so that way we wouldn't get what we deserved. Well, I'd say it differently. God incarnated himself as a man 
and was crucified and resurrected, ridding us of the consequences of our own sin, thus paying the liberation fee, freeing and delivering us from the grips of death and the demonic powers of this world. Seriously, who thinks that a child deserves to have his or her hand burned on the stove? Humanity has in a sense burned our hand on the stove. The pain and injury it causes is punishment enough. Think about it. The central message of Christianity is not only one that escapes his criticism, but it's also the one that best fits into Abraham's dream scenario. So I mean, does it though? I'm not sure it does. At least the form of Christianity that does not require God to be this retributive deity perhaps escapes it, but not really the other ones. I mean, I sort of understand what John is saying here, but it just doesn't escape the criticism. Sure, perhaps God provides a way out from us getting what we deserve, but the thing is some of us still do get what we deserve, right? John's not a universalist, so he still believes that some people will face a form of torture or torment in the afterlife. How does stating the fact that God provides a way out alleviates the charge that God is a monster because he punishes those whom reject him eventually or eternally? A provision of grace just sort of begs the question because some people will still be punished. So us knocking on what we deserve is an act of mercy and the fact that we're offered it freely as a free gift is what we mean when we speak of grace and nothing can be more loving than that. Again, Abraham's charge doesn't seem to be affected that much by John's solution because Abraham's claim is that punishing someone is stupid and evil. John still believes that some will be punished, so I don't see how John actually answered Abraham's objection. But at this point, you may be thinking, wouldn't it be more loving to just send everyone to heaven when they die, even if they don't choose to accept the free gift of entering into heaven? And to this, I would say, no. It would actually be unloving to force us to accept a gift that we don't want. If it's for our ultimate good, why not? I mean, I would prevent my daughter from taking her own life against her will. Am I an unloving parent because I prevented her from causing such a harm to herself? That's a genuine question because if you say no, then perhaps it's also a good thing for God to forcefully override one's will in order to prevent one from choosing an absolute objective horror of an end called hell for the good of said person experiencing infinite eternal bliss. So the loving thing to do would be to allow people to freely choose to accept the gift or not. So even if his theology and his conception of hell were completely accurate, which I don't believe it is, then Christianity would still be the most loving option. Even on Abraham's own view of hell, hell isn't giving people what they deserve because all of us deserve hell. Instead, hell is giving them what they choose, even though God offers them the free gift of eternal life. All they have to do is accept it. What would it mean for someone to choose hell? What does it mean for someone to prefer eternal misery over and above eternal bliss with God? In my opinion, these persons are either insane, akin to a man sticking his hand in a fire screaming in agonizing pain and yet refuses to remove his hand from the flames. That is who we're talking about here when it comes to the issue of hell. What same person wouldn't choose heaven in those circumstances? Even in terms of oneself being confronted with God's presence and the fullness of his glory and majesty, to prefer oneself over God is still akin to the lunacy of putting one's hand in the fire and never removing it. When one talks about hell and people preferring it over God, you are either talking about a person who has never actually known him in any significant sense, and therefore there exists some degree of ignorance of the good and the transcendent. This defense descends into nonsense when you begin to think about what it means for someone to truly reject God. Let's say there's a person that knows God in his fullness. He knows that God is that which makes him whole and that which can exclusively satiate his desire in an ever moving occupation for truth truth, beauty, and love. For what reason would that person then choose the opposite of God? What prompts such an obviously stupid and irrational choice? Non-universalists are not dealing with people in their right minds being sent to hell eternally. Also, what does it say about God that a person knowing that God is better than hell and yet choosing hell anyway? The choice inevitably becomes indistinguishable from randomness and chance. In my opinion, if you choose hell, then you've never really known the good because to know it is to desire it insatiably. If God were to reveal himself to all of creation in his fullness, then everyone would inevitably come to accept him if you are a sane person. Richard Dawkins being confronted with God on judgment day and having all of his misconceptions, ignorances and inaccuracies about reality and God purged from him in an instant when confronted with being itself to 
to think he wouldn't bow his knee and worship just shows that people who think such a thing is possible is confused about how a rational spirit functions in relation to God and God's essence in relation to human souls. No sane human could resist the presence of God in his fullness. Well, as I said before, this response was going to be rather short because John's video was rather short. So that's all that I have for you today, guys. I hope you enjoyed it and I hope this was helpful. Thanks for watching.